Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Barzin Mubasher from Arizona State, and I'm going to present to you a project that we did on field implementation of UHPC for uh, bridge rehabilitation projects in um, Maricopa County. This is not a major department of transportation, but it is a county department of transportation. And I think the challenge that we had was to work with the, with the engineers of the county, and they were so willing to help and work and learn. And the idea is that if we can take our, the technology that we have to the county levels, we can actually help a lot of the issues that we have with our not so um, highlighted type of interstate type systems and regular bridge take rehabilitation. So um, let me start. I should say that I'm a little bit upset with my friend Xavier Destere when he said that no one wants to talk about structural ductility. I do. I really do. And I hope, but, I, but it's not a part of my talk. It's, it's really important to see that the problems that are re created because we don't have proper ro load distribution and the ductility, the ability of the material to carry the load and distribute the damage that exists. And that is what FRC and UHPC provide for us. So these are the highlights of the performance of the material. But Xavier is right. If we use the standard procedures of structural engineers, we would find out that the ductility of FRC is actually lower. It's not because it's lower. It's because we measured the wrong parameters. And I'll be happy to explain that during my talk. So um, this is a um, presentation on the uh, development of UHPC. We developed a project back in 2019 for our Department of Transportation. The idea there was making UHPC with locally obtained material. The idea was not to go with the standardized type of a materials in a bag, do the basic recipe of what does it take to make a concrete that meets the specs. The first spec that we had to get away with was the compressive strength of 22,000 or so. Because in my opinion, compressive strength is not the controlling parameter. It is the ductility, it is the fluctural properties, it's the tensile properties that would dominate the performance of these materials. And we would never get to the case where you would have a uniaxial state of stress of 20,000 PSI or so. We would never get there. So the idea was to develop a low water cement ratio um, uh, and at the same time make the mixtures such that they provide us with the whole range of shear, flexure, tensile properties and use them in order to address the problems that we have at hand. Um, so. Um, the idea of the UHPC definitely for us is to look at how we can reduce actually the amount of rebars that we are using. And the point I need to make is very simple. 50% of the cost of the concrete is in the forming. 30% is in the concrete and 20% is in steel or in that range. We are using so much of the money into that small period of arranging the rebars and if we can address some of this load carrying capacity by adding the reinforcement into the mix in the form of UHBC, we've solved a lot of the problems and actually done a much more sustainable material. So although we're using 3% or 2% fibers, we are still getting a much more um, sustainable material, and I'll try to show that in my final slides. The definite importance of this project is to look at a bridge rehabilitation project. This particular project was a new repair for a bridge that actually lasted only 10 days. We took the entire bridge out, put in precast slabs, and then in the connection pores, we used UHPC. So the volume of the UHPC that's used in here is for, for the entire bridge that was 30 feet, 30 feet long, um, four lanes was less than seven or eight cubic yards. So the amount of the UHPC was not much. It didn't increase the cost of the bridge, but it increased the speed of production. Because some of these rural roads, if you take a bridge out, a family is not going to be able to get to their home. So the deal here was that we're going to replace the entire bridge, all of the new slabs, and also the connection ports in less than 10 days. That was the objective. And um, so basically what you see is the 
That's, that's a picture from the FHWA type of documents, and this is basically the application that we apply in this particular case. With the UHPC, you see the way it is pouring. So uh, this is, the, on this project, we did only the joint, the connection pour. However, just last week, we finished, the next challenge that we had was to mix UHPC in a regular concrete truck and use it for the overlay. The problem with the overlays is because of the super, eleva the, uh, super elevation that we have, because of the slope of one or two percent that we have, your standard UHPC mix is not going to work because of the fact that the material flows. So that you need a stiffer mixer, so uh, mix. So the idea here is look, concentrating on the connection pores. So what are the material um, challenges? Definitely reduce the cost. People run away when you say that it's gonna cost you somewhere about nine to 10,000. But uh, you know the report is available. I'll be happy to share it with anyone who needs it. That's the ADOT report, Arizona Department of Transportation. And the price is about $1,000 to $1,200 per cubic yard, which is still much higher than ordinary concrete, but the volume that we're using is much less. Um, the rational design for the material requires us to first we did the binder design, then we produced aggregates and added the aggregates in there, the size distribution of the aggregates, and then at the end, we put the fibers and measured the characteristic material properties because that's the most important thing. What are the mechanical properties of the material that we have developed? So the basic ingredients are basically our standard. We started with about 50 different mixtures that we just blended it in the lab on a stationary type of a Hobart mixer, looked at different combinations of cement, slag, fly ash, silica fume, and limestone, and then, I'm sorry, and then what we did was to run some basic rheology type tests and also some packing measurements, simulation of the packing, because these are particles that are different size. Although we all call them into this, lump them into this supplementary cementitious materials, the particle sizes are different, and what we, our objective was, was to optimize the packing of the particles at the paste level. That's the first step. Then you optimize it at the mortar level, and then you go to the concrete level. So that is packing, it reduces the flaws, it reduces the uh, pores, uh, improves the permeability, and all of the good things that we're looking for comes not necessarily from the fibers, it comes from the packing that we can generate. So some of the mixes that we have, you can compare the various ones. Sand um, is normally all over the, all over the place because it's an afterthought and it's just on a proportion, whereas the particle size distribution significantly matters. So that's, these are some of the issues that our report addresses as far as how do we optimize it. So we have, we're using the standard aggregate packing models. Very, basically what you need is uh, a good particle size distribution and then you run simulations to see how do you reduce the porosity that you get when you do full particle packing. This is an example of the, or the, the particle size distribution of the different components. Again, we're still not talking about the aggregates, but then we optimize it to the blue curve when you're mixing ordinary Portland cement, slag, fly ash, metakaolin, and such. But then we didn't do all of them. We just did random numbers between all of them and optimally came up with about much, much smaller sections. Then you add in, of course, the aggregates, and of course, the aggregates provide you with this idea that you have different particles of different sizes, and your goal, again, is the packing of the material. So I'll skip these and try to optimize, basically, the, the closeness of the particles and then the packing factor that we have. At the end of the day, you come up with a mix with a certain set of mixtures that you can easily have any technician in any laboratory, you give them the proportion of the aggregates or have them sieve it to that proportion and then mix it. The strength properties then give you that 20,000 or 21,000 PSI or so that you would need. So we could reach 100, as high as 170 megapascal, 20, um, 24,000 PSI. So that was not a problem by going through the mixing. The mixing requires high energy, high energy shear mixing. Not anybody can do it in any laboratory. You need to be able to give it so much energy to be able to just break apart, apart the clumps and mix it. And we did that with a, um, with a just stationary pan mixer and then later on try to improve it in the, in the field. Now let's talk about material properties. Compressive strength, 
We do closed loop testing where we measure the entire load deformation response from that we measure the stress strain. With UHBC, if you're testing it without any fibers, it's extremely brittle. So to measure the post-peak response of a very brittle material, you have to actually measure the circumferential strain and use the circumferential strain as a method of loading. So a single test would take us a day to run compressive strength, but then we get so much data. And what you can see out of the data is the figure in the top, top left, shows the difference between two different mixes where um, you, what, what we're showing is just basically the strength of the uh, strength of the matrix phase the figure in the bottom shows when you add the fibers so even when you're going with the most comprehensive test method you cannot stop the brittleness of the material when it has no fiber when you add fiber now you get the post peak response and that's the ductility that you have with one person the figure on the right is with 3% fibers. So as you beef up the amount of fibers, you're getting energy absorption in the compression zone, and the material actually can start carrying a lot of load. Even when you go down to 30% down from the peak, you're still carrying a significant amount of strain, and you're carrying the load. The material is beginning to behave in an elastic plastic manner. And of course, that elastic plastic manner is shown when you look at the cross-section and the fact that the cracks are bridged. Many fluctual tests that we run, even when we take the sample out of the test machine, it is impossible. You can stick your finger in there, but you cannot cause any type of a load carrying on it because the standard specimen is still carrying 8,000 pounds on it, which means that in service, there is no collapse, complete fracture type of a problem that's going to happen that loads are going to be released. This material stores so much energy and dissipates it. So when you look at uh, some of these tests, so you can see actually the, um, the fluctural test. Now you get other modes of failure where when you're looking at the sample under digital image correlation, you can see the initiation of cracks. And now you have parallel cracks forming at the same time, and these cracks are competing with each other as far as carrying the energy. So it's not just localization into a single point. The localization starts happening at different places until one of them becomes the dominant mode of failure. So what we have done is run a lot of fluctual tests. We have documented the multiple cracking. We measure the load deflection response. But what's important in this process is to actually extract from load deflection the material properties. And that material property is the stress crack width, which is the tensile response. That's what we need for any kind of a modeling. So we back calculate the equivalent effective tensile strength. So what we do here is that this is like a bunch of samples that have been tested, and we extracted the values. Figure on the left is for 1% fiber. Figure on the right is 3%. So we put 3% fibers, and we only get something of the order of 7 or 8 megapascals in tension. That's all we get, but that's all we need because you, need, you don't need to look at 150 megapascal in compression, because what dominates the test is that eight or nine megapascal in tension. But then there is that descending part of the load, which means that you can open the crack by three millimeters, but you're still carrying, let's say at four milli, at, at um, let's say two millimeters, you're still carrying more than three megapascals of load. That is the load that creates that plastic hinge that we design in order to reach to the structural ductility topics that we have talked about. So at this point, we have developed models for fluctural design. So all of these models have been developed at ASU. Basically, we assume material properties, and we can come up with a modified ACI calculation or fluctural calculation, except that now your tensile response is carrying the load and the stress is putting in there. And this thing does amazing when we look at that. So that we get basically the fluctural strength that we run, that 8 megapascal now converts into 20 megapascal apparent fluctural strength that we have. 3,000 PSI fluctural strength. Any day we can produce it. So then this becomes the part of documenting the results, measuring at different stages of the loading what is how much load is being carried, and then now we go back to the field, and this is a Palo Verde project that we finished. The, the slabs have been placed on this small bridge, but then the, the connection pores have been all 
poured in. And you can see the pictures in terms of the size where it goes. So you have these strong elements, which are field ca cast in uh, precast sections, but the connection pour is twice as strong. So it's the glue, it's twice as strong than the material that we're using, which means that the failure will always be in the original material and not in the glue. The filling process is enough and simple enough for people who love working with it because it's in and out, mix it, pour it at one end, and the material flows. This is the flowable type of a material that we have worked with. And um, of course, we've gone through the modeling where the modeling allows us to measure make the test, measure material properties. Once you have the material properties, now you can actually design it for any other kind of application because we have closed form solutions. We have a set of equations that will calculate the fluxure capacity or compression capacity of any reinforced or hybrid type of a, not mineral, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so basically this is the whole idea of drawing, of the, um, doing the fluctual test, calculating upper bound and lower bound calculations for the values, measuring tensile properties. And then we made some of those samples and tested them in the field, where you put um, LVDTs to measure the deflection of the specimen and the measurement of the specimen. And then we can run, let me see if I can run this last one, uh, where um, we're reaching on, on this eight inch thick beam, we get up to about 20. 27,000 pounds. And of course, one can do the calculations and numbers. And you see that you know the crack grows all the way up. And these beams we made with only one rebar in there that was placed in there. So with one rebar, and it was placed at the top. So one of them was, so we tested one upside down, the other one downside up. So basically, you can see what is the effect of rebar by testing the beam, by changing the depth of this section. What is interesting in here is that uh, we can actually compare the plots and we can see that the pound force on the small sample goes up to about 15,000 when the rebar is all the way at the top. And if the rebar is at the bottom, now your curve goes up to somewhere about 27,000. So the contribution of the rebar can be quantified and calculated and taken out. And this is the part that we get all of the ductility. How strong is this system? Let me finish my slide with this. This is a slide that shows we're, I'm comparing plain reinforced concrete beam, which is shown at the bottom. This is the moment curvature, both theoretical and also experimental theoretical moment curvature response. Plain reinforced concrete beam, it is compared with the, with the section that we tried on the UHPC beam with the normal placement of the rebar at the bottom. We're carrying about 30 kip feet on that small section, that connection pore. That compares to stru structural steel. So we concrete, Eight UHPC meets and competes with structural steel in terms of the ductility, in terms of the capacity. There you have it. When you compare the fluctual response of steel and the concrete. The, top, the figure on the top is another project that we have on textile reinforced concrete. If you make, if you make I-beams with TRC, now you can actually go higher, but of course that's a bit deeper section than we have. Thank you so much for your attention. And I